Hi, and welcome to The Parent Equation with me, Aisha Murray. I'm a coach and I primarily support working parents and carers who believe that parenthood shouldn't be a barrier to a successful and fulfilling career. In this podcast series, I chat to inspirational working parents and ask them to share their own experiences of raising children alongside their careers. We talk about the struggles and the moments of joy. And I hope in each episode, there's something that can bring you a bit more strength and positivity. So please follow, listen and subscribe on all major platforms. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Parent Equation. Today, I'm really happy to be joined by John Adams. John is a father of two and the author of dadbloguk.com and also the producer of the accompanying podcast, Dad Pod UK, which I think are very clever play on words there for both of those. So welcome, John. Hi there. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Aisha. No, it's great. And the reason I really wanted to get you on, actually, apart from the fact that I just think what, what you do is a shared passion when it comes to, I suppose, being an evangelist for working parents, is I think there are two sides to your story, which I hope we can get into both of those today. Uh, the first, obviously, is as a working father, um, you've run this blog for many, many years now. So I would say potentially puts you as an expert in that field. And secondly, you are also a LinkedIn change maker, which you actually introduced me to that term. So it'd be great if we can hear a bit more about that as we go through this conversation. So maybe just to start with, can you tell me a little bit about your journey, maybe from when your children were first born and the choices that you made along the way that led you to being, I think, as you are now, the primary carer for your children? Okay, well, if we go back to when my first child was born, that would have been Helen, uh, almost 12 years ago now. Uh, my wife took a few months uh, maternity leave, um, but the, the way I like to say it is that she, there is absolutely no danger of my wife ever becoming chair of the PTA. Okay, so <laughs> she's, she, she's, she's just not that sort of person, <laughs> right? Um, so as soon as her maternity leave was up, she went back to work full time. Yeah. I was working full time and uh, Helen was in nursery five days a week Mm -hmm. now we missed a few uh, of those sort of significant moments in our first steps because they happened with childcare practitioners because she she Mm -hmm. was in nursery and uh then one day my wife found out that helen was the only child of her age going to nursery five days a week okay and neither of us were particularly happy with this but i found it it sort of pulled on my heartstrings in particular and i wasn't hugely happy with my job um whereas uh, my wife's um career sort of seemed to be going places at, at mm. that particular time and so i proposed to her that uh, actually i leave my full-time job and we re- we didn't pull helen out of nursery but i suggested that we reduce her nursery hours and mm. she, would, she would get more time with one of us and I worked out that if I got a part-time job, we could actually afford to do this. Mm. Uh, now, my calculations, I've got to say, with hindsight, were absolutely directly <laughs> wrong. Uh, I mean, I, I basically created a financial crisis that, that we sort of only recently <laughs> pulled ourselves out of. Uh, but uh, that's what we did. And a, a, lot, a lot of people do sort of ask me that question and assume I'm going to come out with, you know, some, you know, dreadful instagrammable words of wisdom <laughs> uh but it, it was a brutally practical decision my yeah. wife had the greater earning potential i didn't yeah. i was happy to do it so yeah that, that, that's what we did now um that did involve me sort of uh you know initially i you know took that in and sort of got a job a few rungs down the career ladder with a local um charity actually and you know i waved goodbye to my days as a higher rate taxpayer Mm. not a bad thing uh (laughs) no this is this is true i mean it's a decision that i i I don't regret at all i mean it's Mm. um there's one financial aspect i will come on to mention actually in a bit that people always overlook but uh um i after you know we then had a, a second child and when our when um helen actually started school it became too much for me to work as well so at that point Mm. I did actually become a stay at home dad. And I will just mention out of interest, the thing that I find fascinating 
was that when I gave up full time work and worked part time, I never mm-hmm. referred to myself as a stay at home dad. Yeah. Other people referred to me as a stay at home dad, uh, which I don't think they necessarily would have done a woman. Um, but just because I had taken that unusual decision, mm. uh, people referred to me as a stay at home dad. And I was called it so often that it just stuck. But it was mm. actually three or four years later till I actually became a stay at home dad. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I had started blogging about my experiences. And uh, when I became, you know, stay at home dad proper, you know, by that point, the blog was bigging in little bits of money here and there. Uh, and I thought, you know, well, I'm onto something here. Why don't I actually mm. do this and try and make money from it? You know, if I, I, I hate the phrase mumpreneur with a passion. <laughs> Good. But uh, I, I thought, you know, they would call me a mumpreneur if I were a mum. So I'm <laughs> going to try this. And from there the blog has grown obviously our, our youngest daughter Izzy has started school that freed me up a bit spent a bit more time uh you know I, I mean it's very difficult to describe yourself as a blogger these days you have to you know we're all social media influencers yeah. these days mm-hmm. uh, I mean I prefer the word content creator but yes I I have built it up into a recognizable brand into a uh viable business and I mean, I, look, I, I'm I'm not going to be buying a condominium in Miami anytime <laughs> soon, but it gives me a way to be uh, financially active, economically mm. active, mm. contribute to the financial to the finances of the family. But I am able to fit it around uh, my children. And as you yeah. quite rightly said, I, I, I remain their main carer. I mean, obviously. Mm. COVID has turned the world upside down. So my wife hasn't actually been into her workplace since last March. Yeah. She is working uh, from home. And that has sort of changed the family dynamic a little bit. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it's me that is getting the kids snacks, uh, you know, mm. quarter past 10 in the morning. It's me mm. that's kicking them out the door to say, right, you've got to go get away from your screen for a screen mm. break. It's me that's taking them out for a walk in the afternoon. Mm. Uh, you know, pre-COVID days, to put that into perspective, it was me that organised the birthday parties. It was me that dealt with the PTA. Uh, I, I did all the, the traditional stuff you'd expect a mum to do, or many people would expect a mum to mm. do. Um, but I, I, I'm running this micro business uh, alongside it, fitting it around the family. And, and you weren't the, the, and you were the chairman of the PTA. That's fine. And you no, weren't, no. you weren't the chairman of the PTA, were you by any chance? Uh, no, no, I, no. <laughs> I'm not the chair. I have been at uh, the kids' previous primary school. I did last a term. Actually, sat on the PTA, okay. and for a couple of years, I was the PTA class rep. Um, but that PTA was extraordinary in that it had it did on two occasions actually have dads as the chairperson okay okay now um you, you i'm sorry to have to say it but I, the ptas are not always that that inclusive or dad friendly but that, no, I, I would, I would that agree. actually uh you know that that one was um was you know interesting that we're not talking about somewhere in hoxton or rieslington it wasn't anywhere mm-hmm. trendy and here mm-hmm. or anywhere like that either so there you go and I have two questions then on, I suppose, linked to your, as you say, brutal decision to become a, a stay at home dad 10 years ago. Now, I, I imagine 10 years ago, that was quite an unusual choice to make. And it uh, didn't it, fit didn't fit the traditional view of the family set up. Um, yes, uh, it was. And I it, it still is um, yeah. a very unusual thing to do. W- what's happened in the meantime is we've had the introduction of shared parental leave. Yeah. Now, uh, shared parental leave is something that I blogged about and wrote about uh, a lot at the time it was introduced. Mm. Uh, the shared parental leave policy that we have in the UK is... Uh, w- w- I had some dealings with, uh, with with Joe Swinson, who was the Equalities Minister at the time in the, yeah. the old coalition government when it was introduced. Mm um and i basically my understanding is is that the ambition had been to introduce a form of shared parental leave that was quite a bit more ambitious than the one that actually was but rome wasn't built in a day we just have to hope in the future that that um you know the shared parental leave system we've got will be improved what what the system as it basically stands is a 
or what's the phrase I've, I've seen it's a transferable maternity leave system so essentially right. all the uh, mum holds all the aces and it's almost like she transfers mm-hmm. some of the leave to dad mm-hmm. there's no ring fence to leave for mum or dad and um, what so basically what's happening is that yes men are taking shared parental leave mm-hmm. they are maybe taking a month or two mm-hmm. maybe three months um there are a very small number of men who are taking, say, six months or, or, or sort of the, the whole 50 weeks is they, that they're mm. legally entitled to. But they are tiny in number. But what we are seeing is more and more men in those very, very earliest days where once they were constrained to only taking two weeks, if they mm. could afford it. There are more men now actually taking shared parental leave for. Yeah, it, it's been a, it's been a great step. OK, it, it's not solved the issues that we'd all like it to have done but it's, it's a good important first step but what shared parental leave has really done where i think shared parental leave has been supremely successful mm. and what i noticed when it was introduced was it created a vast amount of public discussion and discourse about the role of fathers in the early years yeah. of their child's life and that was an incredibly positive step now at that time my children although they i didn't qualify for shared parental leave because my children Mm. were too old um i could still relate to a lot of that now uh, i would say we need to have those discussions because going back say 15 years or 20 Mm. years the question that was asked of men is is he a hands-on dad yeah what we've actually got to a point now is people are saying how hands-on is he mm, mm. so the assumption uh, is you are hands-on to start with in some degree yes yes which which is a very positive step and yep. shared parental leave the introduction of it i personally think has done a huge amount to achieve that now there is a vast amount still to be done mm. to sort of try and actually have men's ability uh, abilities as carers recognized and to actually recognize and give men equality on the domestic mm-hmm. front mm-hmm. and we're never going to get true equality for women until men have true equality on the domestic front so there's a there's a lot to do but yeah. shared parental leave has at least got that discussion going now my children are older now what i would say is i notice a lot of focus in the public discourse and the public discussion it focuses on uh, men's ability to act as a carer for their kids in the early years. Yeah. Where I notice and think the discussion has got to move on to is the issues and challenges that men who have children in the middle years mm-hmm. and the later mm-hmm. years that they face. You go into a library and look on a bookshelf. The, the the you know the the books aimed at men uh for you know for, mm. for, for dads they stop at the age of three yeah there yeah. is nothing mm. so that that's where, where changes have got to made sorry I've, I've given you another really long answer haven't i i do apologize that's, that's fine that's why you're here <laughs> that's why you're on on this show is to give me lots of long interesting answers um the question around parental leave though so you're saying obviously that there are more dads taking some part of parental leave not the whole allocation but obviously in my experience and friends and family and colleagues it's the employers who need to support that because I think a lot of the men that I've spoken to over the years are just very worried their employer won't allow them back in the same way if they take an extended period of leave or they'll miss promotion opportunities or they will you know all manner of things I think do you in your view are the employers doing enough to support that parental leave for fathers uh, uh, uh some are some aren't um mm-hmm. i mean it, it's the usual suspects actually if you look at an employer like aviva um yeah. or a, another good one is actually british land mm-hmm. uh these are organizations that have actually looked at their parental leave policies and mm-hmm. they have equalized them so mm-hmm. it um when i say that uh obviously you've got the government statutory leave but an employer can top that up and an issue that you still find with a lot of employers is if mum goes off for an extended period 
of shared parental leave because mm. we should all get used to calling it shared parental leave the old maternity and paternity you know that 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 language should have been consigned to history in 2015 mm. okay mm. um the employer can obviously voluntarily top up the shared parent uh, the the leave the parental leave uh, and with a lot of employers what you find is that they top up what the mum receives but not the dad so dad still cannot necessarily afford to take an extended period of shared parental leave mm. and as i say it's though it it is it, those sort of bigger uh, city institutions that have recognized this and basically recognized this is a talent retention issue uh, yes. i mean there, there was a very interesting survey done by uh, an organization called daddy life a couple of mm. years ago where uh, they interviewed 2000 men under the age of 40 they called it the millennial dad at life uh, mm. dad at work report daddy mm. life millennial dad at work report that was okay. it um and what they found was uh, was a third of the men interviewed had changed jobs within a year of becoming a father because they found their employer wasn't flexible enough all right okay a further third mm. were actively looking for a new job because mm. they didn't have the they couldn't get the flexibility they wanted from their employer mm. um so there's a huge talent retention issue there and also in the 21st century why are we assuming that dad will only play a support role mm. it, it may actually be such as in my relationship where mum is the one with with the great career prospects mm. uh who um maybe a great parent a great uh, a great mother but actually she's just more suited to being in the workplace uh, you know th yep. there is this issue that we force women into these roles where they might mm. actually be very unhappy mm. likewise we force men into the workplace where they might actually want to stay at home and look after the kids Th these gender expectations do not help anyone and if you think about it what that does is you're forcing very talented women out of the workforce and keeping men trapped in the workforce mm, mm. who are possibly demotivated and don't want to be there that, yeah, that's essentially what these what parental leave policies have uh, have done but it, it is as i say it's the you know the the, the avivas the zurichs the british lands the lloyds of this world uh diageo is another one that springs to mind uh, these these blue chip companies mm. who recognise this and have taken steps. What we've now got is we've got to see this drip down to the SME market. Um, yeah, yeah. And and there's no point pretending otherwise. I mean, th this is a phenomenal cost on small businesses, uh, and I I don't know what the answer is. I don't. But it, it's the only way we're going to get true equality, basically. Well, also now you put on top of that not just the flexibility around parental leave or being a parent and being a carer but you now have obviously the covid flexibility remote remote working issue on top of all that where as you've said your wife and my husband as well are at home now full-time working in their nine to five jobs and are well firstly exposed to the rest of the household which they would never have been before because they're not usually in the house um, and also where they need more flexibility. We all do because we can't do the nine to five like we used to. We have, you know, not everybody has the space to work together happily in unison. We've got people fighting over workspaces. We've got people fighting over the kitchen. We've got, you know, all these things going on. So it's an added layer of flexibility that these employers now need to, I suppose, put into the mix, isn't it? Well, it is. Uh, and while obviously, you know, the impact of, COVID-19 has been horrendous for all of us especially those people who have maybe had it or lost mm -hmm. uh, a loved one or a close uh, you know friend or family member mm -hmm. to it uh, and, and we, we should always remember that and keep that uh, you know in mind it has presented certain opportunities in fact my brother-in-law made a very interesting comment he said if you had gone to the IT department of any sizable company mm. and said to them on uh, was it March the 16th last year Bojo said you're all working from home yeah um, but if you'd said to them right you've got you know what, whatever it was 48 72 hours and then all staff members are going to be working from home mm. Mm. 
you know, that you'd have got, no, I can't do it, mate. You know, can't do it, Gov. <laughs> Actually, do you know what? Necessity is the mother of invention. And I don't know what, what you and your husband's experience was. There seemed to be this, I noticed that there was this two week point of flux. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, things sort of work. But <laughs> after two weeks, everything bedded down. Uh, and yeah, the tech stood up actually yeah. yeah it did uh and yeah we are now in this position i mean covid has on this particular issue covid has presented so many opportunities because from the um obviously it, now we have do have to be careful how, how we present this it hasn't necessarily presented opportunities for the steel workers Mm-hmm. uh of this world and people uh, and in the manufacturing sector mm-hmm. uh and of course we know only too well that um a lot of roles you know, the the, the uh, there are various sectors like the entertainment sector have just been decimated yeah by this. yeah but for those people who are generally office-based or workplace-based to some degree suddenly you know we've discovered that people can work from home from from the low from the operational staff to senior uh, uh managers it was jess staley of, uh, of barclays bank uh, the ceo of barclays mm. said uh, he said you know, just weeks after that the work from home order was issued um that barclays had worked perfectly well with his staff working from their kitchens mm. and that the days of having an office with seven thousand people on it were through uh so COVID, w- you know, basically, the chief executives of these companies have ex- had exactly the same challenges that, that, that we've all had. Mm-hmm. They're at home. They're trying to work while their kids are being remote schooled. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, they're, they're, you know, the pressures of family life have maybe slapped these people around the face. where They've never mm-hmm. actually had to deal with it before. Yes, true. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's going to be. I know the government, you know, we had Jeremy Hunt going on the TV and he's saying that you missed the fizz and excitement of the office. I mean, it's a load of rubbish. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I don't think we've seen the end of the office, but I think what we are going to be seeing long term, and I really do hope we see this because it does present so many opportunities, is that we are going to see hybrid working. So people will go into the office two or three days a week and they'll work remotely the rest of the time. Um, and th- th- I mean, this does enable men to be at home and to be around their families yep. and help out yep. more it helps uh, women to you know it's a talent retention thing for issue i mean for those women like my wife it mm. helps them be at home more around mm. their families whereas it takes you know for, for those of us like myself who are the main carers for their kids it takes a bit of the domestic pressure off of us yep definitely um it's it, I, I it's a win-win but also that if we if we look at this from a bigger uh, perspective there are certain organizations that have had it too good for too long mm. you know the rail companies and the people mm. who hold those the big companies mm. i'm not talking about the small retailers who i feel very sorry for but the people who hold the franchises of those out retail outlets in the train stations yeah where you, where you go and buy your dreadful overly priced coffee <laughs> actually if people are working from home they are more likely to go to a local cafe or a local yep. retailer to buy that cafe. Yep. We've got opportunities in the suburbs and the provinces away from the city centres to mm. actually make money. And the thing about small businesses, they pay tax. Yeah. Yes. We won't go into that in this podcast, but yes, I know where you're going with that statement. Mm. <laughs> now, the other thing talking about the uh, says opportunities you've mentioned is that also our children, obviously, um, especially the younger ones who maybe weren't exposed to as much tech as their older siblings are suddenly becoming exceptionally tech savvy, being able to go in and out of Microsoft Teams or Google Classroom lessons with ease without needing us to help them. So this is going to create a very different generation, I think, of sort of digitally minded children as well. So I wonder how that's going to play itself out as they get older and enter the workplace later on. Well, it's funny. So I, I actually posted something to uh, link my LinkedIn um, profile the, the other day, mm-hmm. uh, which I must mention my change makers thing in a minute. Um, yes. But uh, the um, I, I made the point that I'd just been casually observing my own children. Mm-hmm. Yes. OK, they're children. They need a little bit of a prod. They need a bit of oversight. But they're sitting down with their laptops 
headphones, earphones go on. Mm. They are skipping from messaging uh, classmates or teachers to doing live lessons to when live lessons aren't on. They're going back and uh, completing other work. They're submitting this work online. Mm. And I was just in my kitchen, just casually watching this the other day. And I first, my first thought was, these guys look like millennial gig economy <laughs> workers. Yeah. And the second thing I thought was, these this generation is going to stick two fingers up to the nine to five Ooh. Monday to Friday job, because you know who knows this COVID thing. It, it's it's decimated two academic years. Yeah. It's not impossible that this is going to spill over into a third mm-hmm. academic mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. They're just used to this. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, there there are horrendous downsides to the COVID situation. They can't actually go outside and mingle with their friends. Mm. And, I, and you know, socially, I do worry about this. I do worry about screen time yeah. as well, because it's bugger yeah. what else for kids to do. So I think mm. in every family, screen time's increased. So mm. uh, if, if it hasn't, then I salute you. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, the... the they are experiencing a different thing. Now, I, th- I think we have got to be very careful because I'm um, I'm personally deeply suspicious uh, of the academy school system. It's no mm. secret. I, I, mm. I see huge holes with it. And I am very, very worried that what we may see is certain academy schools are going to say, oh, well, you know, we, we can push 90 kids into a lecture theatre and zoom in a lesson right. you know, I, 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 yeah. I think we've got to be very careful mm. about the long-term impact on education um you know last March I was really worried like what's it going to be like if the kids have to spend a day a week at home forever being a, maybe that's something we're going to see oh god don't <laughs> um well th- th- this is why I'm saying you know, we, we've maybe got to mm. be careful what, what what could the potential impact on education be I mean there could be real opportunities I mean for um for, for people adults who maybe want to s- distance learn degrees yep. and so on i mean my particular thing actually during the first lockdown um i uh, basically failed gcse maths when i was at school there's a whole story behind this mm-hmm. um and i uh, i took it well I, I made a rash decision i was I, I appeared on the victoria derbyshire show program with uh, bobby seagull who's a big um uh he, he captained one of the university challenge teams he's oh, right. at Cambridge, yeah. uh, big mathematician promotes adult literacy uh, sorry mm. adult numeracy mm. and i appeared on um we do the Derbyshire show with him d- discussing how parents mm. struggle to do math homework with their kids yeah. and i rather rashly said on air that well you know i've always wanted to sit mass gcse again so maybe i will it's taken me a few years to get around to doing it but i have actually been sitting mass gcse um i've done it i've sat the exam uh twice over recent months actually because uh, first time i didn't quite get enough marks to get a pass second time hopefully i will um <laughs> but i've been doing that distance learning it's, it's just seeing my kids doing this just spoke my thoughts you know what i don't i don't actually need to be physically present with a tutor no. i can do yeah. this online so um i have to say thank you to mike at pie tutor for all his help uh but you, you know there are going to be opportunities from this but when it comes to educating children that we have we have maybe got to be a bit careful and did by doing your math gcse in later years and having children did that has that changed the way you look at the way your kids are learning and help to you empathize with their situation it's a bit early yet um because my eldest daughter has, you know she only started secondary school in yeah. september what a year to move up to secondary mm. um it's a bit early yet but I, you know I, but, but one of the the reasons i was actually curious to do it was because you know i could see from the way they were being taught and that the, the master were being taught at primary school was more advanced than i was ever taught at secondary school yeah, yeah. and i thought i, I want to know more about this and i thought it would be really really interesting to actually sit a gcse as an adult so i would know what my kids are actually mm. going to go through now mm. i'll be quite honest sit in the exam and so on it uh, uh, and I'm sorry to break it to, to anyone here who's thinking that exams have gone all techno and, you know, all whizzy. Actually, <laughs> it was damn similar 
to, to sort of going into the room when I was sort of 15 yeah. years old yeah. and, and you know you can only have these things on the desk and so on and of course it was totally bizarre because the first exam I sat last November I walk into this room and it was full of because it was I sat at a private testing center not at, not at the school yeah. but because of course all the exams were cancelled over the summer so kids didn't all get the grades they wanted and I ended up going into this room full of the most miserable looking <laughs> bunch of teenagers oh, ever no. And when I walked in, within about three seconds, I realised it. And I thought, oh, shit, I can see what's going on here. These these guys have probably got parents at home putting them under real pressure. To yeah, pass yeah. Um, and then you come in singing and dancing, excited about doing a maths GCSE. Yeah, and, and I'm there like, I've got no professional reason. It doesn't matter if I get this exam or not. I'm just doing this for the lols. Um, I, I did wonder about wishing them all good luck. Or I thought, you know what? <laughs> What, no. They're going to be wondering, what is this middle-aged weirdo doing sitting <laughs> in GCSE? Uh, I, I wasn't sure I'd got an, enough marks to pass uh, the foundation GCSE paper that I sat. So I put myself in to sit the international GCSE, mm. the IGCSE, mm. um, a couple of months later. Uh, so I just sat those two. Uh, over the past two weeks, I've sat one paper a week. Uh, the difference between the two papers essentially is the IGCSE is two two hour exam papers and you're allowed to use a calculator for both. But the oh. questions are slightly more difficult to compensate for the fact that you can use a calculator for both. But with the foundation, the usual foundation GCSE paper that most uh, English and Welsh kids would sit, um, the it's three one and a half hour papers and one of the papers is only mental arithmetic okay that, that's probably too much detail for you that's but the fine. bizarre thing was whether when i actually came to sit the igcs when i sat the the the, the foundation gcc mm -hmm. paper we were you know we were living the high life in tier two and, the, and the, <laughs> the, the restrictions weren't that tight by the time i came to sit the igcse paper uh, we were in full lockdown mm -hmm. Uh, and sitting an exam is actually an exemption. You are allowed to travel for that. So I was allowed to travel to the exam centre. But when I got there, I was told I had to wear a face mask for the whole mm. exam. So oh my for the whole of the two hours, uh, you know, myself, the invigilator, and the, the one other student who was sitting in the, the, the paper, we had, to, we had to wear face masks. So, you know, it's a bizarre world we're living in. I also, I presume you can't breathe properly in those things anyway. So having to sit through an exam, trying to concentrate on maths particularly, and not being able to breathe properly it's not the ideal combination well it's not i mean, I mean when the, the schools went back to school in september i did kind of think the correct thing for the government to do was to say look we will try and hold gcse's in the summer mm. but I, I think it became uh, clear within just a few weeks that actually gcse's were going to be untenable mm. Mm. so I, I was i really i really think the government messed up massively with the mm. approach they've taken on that mm. front um uh, for, for this very reason, you know, you're, you'd be expecting kids to have to do lateral flow tests before sitting the exam. And they have to yeah. do face yeah. muscle. It's just not fair. And it's you're putting fair. a huge burden on teachers. But um, yeah, yeah absolutely. Can. Absolutely. So, John, let's talk about your LinkedIn change maker status, as I mentioned at the top of this podcast, because I think it's a really interesting area. For, I suppose people maybe not know exactly what it is. So let's just start from there. And please tell us more about what exactly that entails. Yes, yes. So yes, moving on completely. <laughs> my, completely change the soft topic. <laughs> from my uh, from my youthful academic failings and me putting them right in later life. Uh, yes. So LinkedIn Change Makers is a superb uh, campaign, and the reaction it's got. I mean, my word, I forget how many awards the campaign's been nominated for, but I think it's nearly like fifteen. Mm. Uh, Peter say it has won some of them. Um, so this was a campaign launched by LinkedIn. Uh, there are seven of us change makers and keeping mm. it very brief, we are we all have a particular area of interest and specialism and we are campaigning to change the modern workplace one way or another. So, uh, look, I won't list everyone because I'd, I'd, I'd be here all day, but there's there's a wonderful chap called Ben West, who mm -hmm. is a mental health campaigner who is looking to uh, improve uh, um, mental health provision within the workplace there's an individual called lizzie carr who is essentially an environmental campaigner and is looking mm -hmm. to make workplaces think more about the environment mm -hmm. we have alexander uh, leon who's a, a diversity and inclusion campaigner mm -hmm. uh, you know, campaigning to make workplaces more uh, diverse uh, um, uh, there's a, a, a disability campaigner 
uh, yeah, the, the list goes on. Um, mm -hmm. There's myself. I uh, my particular passion is making uh, flexible working more available and more acceptable for anyone who has caring responsibilities. No, so that, you, are, you are looking at parents and carers flexibility rather than flexibility for all, just to be more specific about what your well, angle is on it. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain amount of overlap. I mean, I, yeah. I think everyone should be, uh, should have the right to flexible uh, working. It's not simply a case of giving everyone the right to flexible mm. working. It, it is a case of making it acceptable, such as the point you made earlier about uh, some men are wary of taking time away from the workplace because they worry about the long term impact mm. it'll have on their career. Yeah. Uh, is, you know, men have the same concerns about putting in a flexible working request yep. because men are twice as likely as a woman to have a flexible working request turned down. Yeah. And now this does nothing for men or for women, basically, mm. for ha mm. having th this disjointed approach. And Yes, uh, my particular passion is is uh, uh, and making this acceptable for carers as well because there are a um, huge number of grandparents out there who yeah. are unpaid carers, mm. helping keeping you know younger people uh, in the workplace. There are individuals out there who are having to care for disabled friends mm. and relatives. Mm. Now, th this is where COVID has actually been a real a uh, gift actually because we've seen flexible remote working has suddenly been opened up for everyone uh, or where where feasible as i say mm. there yep. there are still those lines of work where it isn't um yeah. but uh, it, you know it's it's <laughs> we've got to maintain the pressure we, we've seen that it's it works we've seen that it can be done uh, i don't think anybody particularly wants to go back to sitting on a rammed commuter train uh you know and and well, actually one of the the interesting impacts of this is that earlier on in the pandemic uh, the research charity the fatherhood institute did some research into the amount of time that men were were spending with their children mm. now admittedly it was starting from a small base because of course most men are are, are generally the providers and so out of the workplace yeah. but they found that the amount of time that uh, men were spending with their children had increased by 52 percent and that was largely because they are not commuting oh yeah absolutely 100 percent. Um, i mean it was a great example of that is this morning my husband normally would be out of the house by seven quarter past seven to get on the rams train but he had what mm -hmm. felt like at least a 10 minute cuddle with our little girl before mm -hmm. breakfast and he normally wouldn't have even seen her in the morning yeah. He would have been gone before she'd woken up. So just those little just those little moments of of unadulterated joy, which we didn't have before. Yes. Yes. Um, so there's, you know, I think we, we've, we've, we've seen this, this can be done. We've seen it can work. Mm -hmm. I just hope what we now see is root and branch review of job design uh, and acceptance that the tech is there and it works. Yep. Um, I mean, I think we'd all love super fast broadband to be available everywhere. Uh, mm. I mean, I think the, the real struggle I feel of this pandemic has been the fact, not so much in this second lockdown, because obviously the education provision for those of us with slightly older children anyway, has been very good, I feel. And actually, mm. it does give parents more of a chance to actually get away and work. During the first lockdown, it was actually more of a case of we were all having to homeschool our children mm. at the same time. But uh, if you remove the element of having to educate your children at home, because um, they are actually at school, uh, actually flexible working where it can be done. Mm. And we now know it can be done in a lot more places than we originally thought. Um, is a much more feasible option and i think it's actually going to be very very difficult for employers to uh for those employees that want to i not don't, don't think they all do but um to to reel this back in um because you know if people have actually been productive during the pandemic and people then put in flexible working requests mm -hmm. it's going to look very odd if they get turned down um so yes we, but we've got to keep up the pressure we, we've got to um 
got to keep campaigning and i've really got to thank linkedin for for having me on board to do this because it has been a, an amazing opportunity yeah and it's obviously i mean linkedin as a platform is as we know is an extremely effective platform for communicating connecting getting that message out there so it seems like a natural place for you to be advocating for for working did they did they come to you out of interest or was it some kind of um because only seven change makers aren't there i think you said yes yes so yes they, how... they, 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 they approached me okay approached me. okay that's great that's what uh, yeah shows... and we had uh <laughs> we had a uh, a photo it was rather rather actually one of my last times in central london we i had to go into central london on 10th of march um last year for a photo shoot uh and of course it was very odd you know going into to town because everything there was no lockdown at that point but we mm. were all just sort of a bit wary you know every time anyone coughed on a bus or a train <laughs> oh my word you know um but yes it was uh so yeah we had we, we had the photo shoot have been taken then and um uh, and they launched a campaign shortly afterwards but then how to get into work so i've obviously again my conversations i've been having with people around remote working etc there are a lot of people i've spoken to who are for example in house shares or other residential situations where the space doesn't exist for them so they are having to have quite important team meetings from their bedroom or from wherever they can find a space in their house so when you have a situation where actually people want to go into the office or need to go into the office because they haven't got the space at home how do you think that's going to work when you've got these sort of people who want to be more at home but people who want to go back in how are the employers going to cope maybe it's more a practical question around managing desk space and how big do the offices need to be in the future to accommodate half the workforce half of the week so that's going to be a minefield anyway I think well yes uh, no and, and actually that is if I can say anything that that what you've mentioned there is the uh sticking point actually mm. it is the one challenge that can't be can't be dodged you can't smooth over it um and I think actually uh one of the issues that i've seen or, or sort of witnessed in um oh, sorry with uh or did hearing people talking about is younger people maybe or single people uh who live on their own for whom actually work was a great place for social interaction then yeah. could, yes you have got those people um who do live in circumstances that do not lend themselves mm -hmm. Uh, to remote working I mean I see various ways of, of, of dealing with this one is that yes as I said earlier I, I don't think we're seeing the end of the office mm. we're probably going to see uh, people spending a lot less time mm. in the office and I don't feel that is a bad thing uh, but there are other options out there uh, such as co-working spaces and yep. I can see people maybe making uh, better use of co-working spaces and I can see corporates making use of, of co-working spaces mm -hmm. and um, I, I do wonder what the impact is actually going to be on workplaces long time because I have heard people say that um, companies are going to save a huge amount on real estate mm. they're pro that they there must be savings that are going to be made but if large offices are going to have to be socially distanced for all mm. eternity mm. then you know are people going to have to retain the office space they've got but have it spaced out I mean I, I just don't know actually um, that, and, that and also a lot of the offices at the moment have five ten-year leases anyway so even if they're allowed to well even if they're not allowed to go back for the next two years they still have to pay rent on the lease in the city for several years to come with these empty buildings well, yeah and the interesting thing actually is although pinterest is obviously a, a tech company if you look at what pinterest did uh at the start which not long before the start of the pandemic pinterest had actually just signed leases on a whole new headquarters mm. uh and they took the decision that it was actually going to be more cost effective for them to just you know get themselves out of the contract and allow staff to work from home so yeah. an enormous expense mm, mm. that's what pinterest did mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean who knows I mean, actually i think the area that i'd be very interested to look at is in i think this is going to impact on house design yeah i, th I think houses in the future are going to have maybe not offices 
but you know little office spaces mm-hmm. where people could work from because i mean <laughs> i mean i'm sorry kids but the one thing the one prediction i take away from this is the end of the snow day and that type <laughs> of thing because uh yes uh, you know that that learning is going to go remote uh mm. in in future um so houses are going to have to be built in a way so that pe- people have got um office space and you know this young generation as i said at the you know earlier they're, they're going to grow up expecting to work from home uh well some, maybe not permanently but they're not going to expect to, to be doing nine to five it, in a workplace and neither are us adults frankly no so because we all, know, I said, we all know we all know it works yeah, yeah so, so can't we argue with that especially as a child if you think it that's it it's, it's very black and white it works it works so why change it yep exactly yeah. so john i think we're probably coming to the i mean we could talk for hours i think i knew this would happen at the beginning of this podcast that it could probably go on and on and on which is great so are there any final before i ask about your contact details etc any sort of final thoughts that you wanted to share before we wrap up um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll repeat what I said earlier in that th- I, I do feel this is a gender equality issue. Mm-hmm. We're not going to get gender equality for women until men have gender equality at home. And uh, one of the big steps to achieving that is ensuring that men and women have equal access to flexible working and that it is acceptable and it is acceptable at all levels of mm-hmm. an organization and just a couple of points actually i haven't said while yeah. we'll be talking one managers need to have diversity training where they don't simply learn about the impact mm-hmm. of, uh, of motherhood on employees <laughs> they need diversity training on the impact when, when men become fathers yeah um and the other thing is we need senior managers uh people like uh, chris hurd is a good example from first base hq he takes to twitter to talk about how remote working enables him to spend time with his children mm-hmm. we actually need senior man- more senior managers to come out uh and say this and people will be expecting women to come out and say that but we're actually boys you need to come out mm-hmm. and say this and mm-hmm. you need to make your male employees take this message home and and, yeah. and live it. Yeah, and lead by example. Exactly, yes, lead by yep. example. Mm. Mm. Precisely. Great. Thank you, John. So I'm sure there are plenty of people who want to get in touch with you for various reasons. So what's the best way and where can we find you? Uh, yes, you'll find me on uh, uh, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest. Um, mm at dad blog uk um i the the blog is simply dad blog uk.com now yep. the podcast uh, is dad pod uk uh, you'll find that on apple and google podcasts it's also on libsyn mm-hmm. um and i have got a separate uh, instagram account for that. that that's simply dad pod uk um so yes you can find me on all those channels in 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 many ways and LinkedIn, of course. How could I forget that? <laughs> Honestly, what a moron. Um, yes, now, do give my profile a follow. Uh, you, you, don't, um, you don't have to formally like me as, as a LinkedIn change maker. Mm-hmm. You can actually just follow me, uh, which is a bit easier. So you can actually see all my posts when, when, when they come up uh, without me having to approve you. So, yes, you will find me as John Adams Dad Blog UK. And I guess the LinkedIn aspect, what, apart from obviously following you on LinkedIn, you want people to be getting involved in that conversation, don't you, on LinkedIn and, and sharing and commenting on those particular issues? Share and comment and get get onto LinkedIn and tell me your stories uh, mm. about flexible working, your experiences mm. of asking for flexible working. Uh, I do want to hear them. And I do I do regularly post to LinkedIn stories, actually. Okay. So you will also find me. Uh, posting there great well thank you so much john like i said it's been fascinating talking to you and i could talk to you for a lot longer so maybe i'll get you back on i think there's probably plenty of and actually definitely get you back on because as things change and advance and all the work you're doing does start to make an impact um for fathers then i'd certainly like to get you back to discuss how things are progressing well uh, you know where i am i do i do now (laughs) i do now (laughs) so thank you so much john have a great day and speak again soon 
and you. Thanks ever so much. Bye. 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 John's passion for fatherhood, modern day parenting and flexible working is infectious. And I'd urge you to get in touch with him to share your experiences so he can continue to push the agenda for all working parents. Thanks for listening and remember to share and follow the podcast on all major platforms. See you next time.